Boo. See this yellow cliff behind me? Go straight up. Nothing but a big old volcanic crag. Got a little sulfur and a little antimony or stibnite, however you like to see it on the periodic table. At the very top, there's a flat. Most people look at that and they say, there's no way you can take a horse up that. But we do it all the time. And uh, so we'll show you how. We're finishing a trail that's a little better today. We've got it within about 100 yards of the top. And uh, you'll get to see how we do it. Halfway up the bench ridge, this is where it's still calm and pinions and junipers and a little bit of uh, volcanic sand makes the horses work. We'll go to the next bench, which is another couple hundred feet higher, give another little bit of air, then we'll start into the rocks and the cliffs and you'll get an idea. If you look down there, the river, you can see the altitude we've gained. So you see behind me, we're up on the second bench, ready to start the rocks and the switchback. For those of you who are uh, used to arenas and stalls, this is gonna look a little bit intimidating. A lot of people that ride with this quit. They just say, I ain't doing that. I'm not gonna ride up there. We, we ride at levels higher than the average because we break a lot of horses for the public. We train horses for a wide variety of people, but my primary clientele are serious, legitimate horsemen. So they're looking for uh, outfitting stock, guiding stock, cowboying stock. They're not looking for a, a panda bear that they can put in a, a cutting arena. They're looking for legitimate mountain horses, so just like the Navy SEALs that train at a 10 so that if they have to rescue someone in a situation of maybe a 5, they're more than prepared. It doesn't do to train for a 5 if you might run into a 6. I guess you get the concept. So when you see us doing things that are extreme on horses, you have to understand we train at a 10 so that you can enjoy your horse safely at a 3. So when all you soccer moms start sending me little bad memos of you abusive wild cowboy, just pause for a minute and realize that there's people like me out there doing this so that other people stay safe their whole life long. I have been guiding and outfitting and training horses for over 40 years and I have never had a trip to the hospital with a client yet. So. Unless your experience is grander than that, and unless your track record is better than that, maybe you should pause before you throw rocks at our training methods. We didn't come here because we fell off the turnip truck and decided to be Bronx and Donks. We came here because we are seven generations deep of horsemen, and we train the sort of horses and mules in the sort of places that we do because we're expecting to put out the finest saddle animals in the world, anywhere in the world. You can't just do that casually. You have to, you have to be serious about it. So the country we go in is pretty serious. That's all, about all there is to it. naps in there on hot days. <laughs> oh. Oh. Now this trail's cut in 
right into the side of nothing but a big lava flow talus slope off of a disintegrating mound that's uh, I guess as geology goes pretty young because it's pretty high those of you know anything about geology the plains are the oldest dirt on the continent because the mountains have been made low and your highest mountains like the Rockies and the Andes and the Himalayas those are your youngest mountains because the continental shift has driven them up through plate tectonics and they're high but over time as they freeze and crack and disintegrate and freeze and crack and disintegrate they get lower so the Mongolian steppes pretty old country Rockies Himalayas Andes that's young exciting new adventurous mountains and since we have a lifespan of less than a hundred years and they have a lifespan of millions and billions we don't care how young or old they are they're all new to us this is a youngster here In areas where it collects sun like in the afternoon this is warm right here this big rock it's a huge monolith and it takes in heat all day long and it holds it so when you come through here in the afternoon or the evening it's warm in this little pocket away from the wind but you can see where it goes around this cliff it turns right back into a dragon's lair and uh, this horse's brother I rolled off of here the first time I brought him up here he got, he was in a little bit of oxygen debt. He was grabbing for air. I got off of him and just was gonna lead him along while I cleared some trail. And I looked back and his eyes rolled back in his head. He'd first time at altitude, first time with work on him. And uh, he just started to roll down the mountain. So I went down and followed him down and tied him to a tree in a nice flat spot where he caught his air and he uh, regrouped and we went back and took it a little slower went clear to the top but uh, like I said it's not for ninnies uh, he didn't really look like he was in that bad of shape but even a professional who's done it all his life can misjudge the oxygen of another if you've ever hiked with a fat chick you know what I'm talking about you think it's just nothing let's just go up there and they're gassed out halfway up and screaming for water and their face is red and flush and pretty soon they sit down and start talking about things that aren't pertinent and you realize they're just gone into county town could happen with a fat man nothing against fat chicks but in my experience with a fat chick and you can tell them next time you know you could go on a walk two or three times a day before you hire an outfitter to take you into the mountains and uh, pass out <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah we have probably reams and reams of stories about people who are not prepared for the country our job is to make sure the horses are prepared so that no matter who you put on there I mean we pack out dead elk and they're not exactly ready to run so we can pack anything but it's best if the people do a little preparation physically because a lot of places we have to get off and hike we get off and walk and give the animals a break and and uh, you know when you're chasing cougars and bears you don't know where they're gonna go Cougars go right up rocks like this, and the hounds get into them. You got to save your hounds from getting tore up, and you got to get to the cougar. And uh, you know, you can't uh, get up there and say, "Oh, sorry, I'm out of shape. I guess we'll let the dogs die and the cougar run off and the animals perish." You, you can't. You got to be at least equal to the task. And so, it pays when you book a trip to do a little bit of uh, maybe not drinking a lot of soda pop and get out and. At least take the stairs to your office instead of the elevator, huh? Watch your leg on that rock.
hit your bags on that rock when you get there. Okay. Now when you're riding a mule, make sure you listen to your mules. Horses, you can force to do things they shouldn't do. And they'll gas out and they'll stumble and they'll fall and they'll cause a wreck. Mules are very intuitive to their own condition. If a mule says, I'm done, I don't want to go. You know, you've heard stubborn as a mule. It's generally not the mule that's stubborn. It's the person handling the mule that's trying to get them to do something that they're not prepared to do. And so if a mule tells you, I'm tired, I need a break, you should give him a break. You'll find if you'll just wait for a while, he'll go. But if you start to beating on them uh, because you want to go and they don't want to go, in most cases, they've got, they've got a point. They know what they can take. So horses, you have to be their best brain for them because they'll go till their lungs pop, their heart blows, and they die. They're loyal. They love their master. They'll serve their master. But as the old-time mule skinners will tell you, a mule will only do what's fair. And when he's decided what's fair, he's generally done, and he'll stop. The reason we use mules is they're sure-footed, and generally speaking, what a mule considers fair is often more time, more than what a, a horse can do. And so they have, they have certain advantages. But uh, the burrow mentality that they have is very self-preservation oriented. So when they get into trouble, they'll just stop. When they do that, I always at least give it a good look around and give it a second guess because more often than not, I would say, the mules are right. They know. And uh, so mule skinners out there know that. People who are, you know, maybe thinking of making the jump from horses to mules. Uh, I could go on for hours about that. Somebody wants to ask me sometime, I'll give you 45 years of experience of the difference. Pros, cons, all the stuff. Uh, they both have plenty of reasons why you would do one or the other. But the best thing to do is hear all the truth and then decide what your situation is. And if, if it justifies a mule, if that's what you need, and uh, then at least make an informed decision. All right, see that rock right there? It will get your knee. So just turn a little sharper than you think. on that one. <coughs> That's what you're going to face if you don't face this. Ooh. Now when you get up in country like this, if you've ever been in a, uh, say a basketball practice where your coach makes you run wind sprints, that's where you go really fast and hard for a short distance, then rest, then really fast and hard for a short distance, then rest. Whenever you're working horses, if you want them to be good horses, you don't push them at a plod. You know, this mule's a little resistant. You see me whipping him with the rope back and forth. I'm trying to encourage him to have an aggressive movement, but then I rest him quite a bit. You know, we only went, geez, not even 100, maybe 200 feet but it's steep country and we're at high altitude. The idea is teach him to move aggressively so his work ethic doesn't diminish. He always is trying to do his best for you when he's moving, then give him more breaks so that he doesn't diminish over time. One of the big mistakes I see people make all the time is they're not really conscious of what their animal's doing. And so they'll spur them and whip them and go for hours and hours. And the horse gets slower and more plodsome. And what you're doing is you're training them that slow and plodsome is pretty much the norm. Then somebody else gets on them and they're just slow and plodsome. And they're beating and spurring and you just get these plunky, clawed horses. Well, it's because you've taught them that no matter how much you uh, spur them and whip them, they're going to have to reach some sustainable gait and maintain it. If you want a horse that really gets out and moves, the best way to teach them is to make them work hard till they go into oxygen dead a little bit, till their muscles fatigue a little bit. But as soon as they've worked really hard and you can see them start to ebb, pull them up, give them plenty of air, watch their flank. If their flank's going poop, 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 they're working too hard. They're trying to get that air oxygen back into their blood. If it's going 
then they're in a sustainable gait. And you get them in too bad of trouble in real, real oxygen debt, they'll just uh, go down on you. And I've seen plenty of that. I race endurance races. Those are 100 mile races. You got about 24 hours to complain, complete it. In fact, you have exactly 24 hours to complete it. But some of those races are run in 11, 12, 13 hours. Can you imagine what those horses are doing, what they're going through? You get them in trouble and they die. That's why there's a vet check every 15 mile. It's because sometimes the owner has an ego and sometimes the horse isn't in the condition they need to be and they'll push them too hard. I can't even tell you the amount of horses I've seen in races go down. The AERC does a good job with PR, not publicizing much of it, but uh, they've also done a great job of making it safer. But in the old days, my gosh, there was a, a cowboy with high elbows and a big ego and they were killing their horses about every race. We'd see one or two dead horses because they thought they were gonna run with the Arabs. <laughs> You know, the, the night before, I've never seen him tired by this horse. This horse is tough. He'll run with them dad damn Arabs. The next day, 15 miles from camp, they're on their side with two veterinarians pounding around on them with mineral oil and electrolytes and propping them back up, and then they die. Seen it lots of times. So when you're riding horses, especially in this country where you're just stuck to the side of a cliff like a spider on a wall, you better pay attention because you get a horse in trouble here, he's going to tumble like a weed to the bottom. Those of you who know my buddy Big Jim at Red Rock, his mule fell 4,000 feet and splattered like a, like a water balloon on the rocks below, saddle and all. Jim threw a lariat around a log and hung on, 71 years old I think at the time, no 74 years old at the time. and. Uh, they pulled him back up, but he had a broken sternum and a broken, he had a lot of stuff broke. A lot, too many things to be broke at 74 years old, but he survived and the mule didn't. And it was just a, a logging accident where he was on top of a cliff trying to build a trail with a log. The log slammed into the mule. Can't remember all the details, but he, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, that's a tough bird to be, uh, I, I've seen the cliff, lots of pictures of where the mule went over. 4,000 feet so we wouldn't fall like that but we'd be just as dead so I don't know if it can, if 200 feet or 4,000 feet maybe you just get a little longer time to think about how bad it's gonna hurt but you're gonna die so you got to pay attention when you're riding in this kind of country